So my name is Dan Gilbarg. I'm a professor of sociology and chair of the newly formed BCC Multicultural Committee, which is producing this event. And I want to welcome you to the first event of what we hope will be a full year-round program of events that address a full range of diversity issues. That includes race, ethnicity, gender, religion, immigration, and disability. Um, I want to thank all the teachers here who have brought their classes and others that have chosen to attend on their own. Um, most of you should have received a calendar of events that we have planned for the fall. And when you look at it, you'll see that we're producing events that address a variety of issues, including immigration, inequality in education, historical origins of inequality, and Native American culture. We also want to call your attention to the next multicultural event of the semester, Living with ALS, sponsored by the One Book Project, which is being held a week from today in C111. We hope that you will come back and attend other events during the semester. We are committed to planning effective events that are truly educational. To that end, we are asking you to fill out an evaluation form that many of you received and others will be passing it around at the end of the event. Um, that way we know what has been working and what needs to be improved. The evaluation form also includes an option for people to share their contact information if they'd like to be notified about future events. And I should add, if people are interested in being involved with our committee, uh, you should indicate that as well, because uh, we can add additional members. I want to thank the very energetic and committed multicultural committee members who are working hard to make our program events a reality. And I also want to thank the BCC administration, particularly the Dean of Academic Affairs, Sarah Garrett, and President Spraga, who have given support to this and took the initiative to get the multicultural committee going. Um, so thank you very much for your support. I would now like to bring, bring up President Spraga to say a few, few words of welcome. Well, thank you, Professor Gilbar. Uh, what a pleasure and great to see such a wonderful audience for this event. Uh, I don't want to take a lot of time, but I just want to say how much we embrace diversity at Bristol Community College. It's so important. It strengthens us. Uh, our differences come together and makes, us, uh, makes our whole a lot stronger. Uh, it enriches our class discussions. It enriches our culture here at the college, inside and outside the classroom. Uh, and uh, we've been working very hard to promote uh, an appreciation and celebration, not just an appreciation, but a celebration of diversity. It's our differences that make us strong and bring us together. Uh, uh, the various perspectives and discussions and, uh, as I say, it enhances our uh, learning process here at Bristol uh, Community College. Please do uh, keep in mind the uh, uh, wonderful calendar of events uh, that we have. Uh, I hope that you'll be able to support them and create some of your own and bring them to the Multicultural Committee. I can't thank enough uh, the Multicultural Committee for its great work in, uh, in furthering this high priority for the college in, uh, in diversity. Uh, so I'm going to uh, uh, look forward, as you are, to this wonderful talk. It couldn't be more appropriate. Uh, remember that uh, the next event is about living with ALS. has to do with the one book uh, selection of Tuesdays uh, with Mari, uh, and uh, that's an unfortunate theme of that book. Uh, so I hope that you'll be able to uh, come to that as well, as well as the other events as well. Um, I'm going now introduce uh, uh, Professor Marlene Pollack, also of the Multicultural Committee, who will introduce our speaker. Please enjoy it, and I look forward to uh, many more events with you. Thank you. Professor Pollack. Thank you, well, welcome, everyone. Um, we have this great opportunity to learn about Islam, a religion uh, of 1.5 billion people in the world. Many of us in the United States have no knowledge of Islam. I know through my formal education, there was no mention of it, even though it has been a major force in history since its founding in the seventh century. Researching, learning, and then teaching about Islam Myself and my students have been impressed with it. It's historical, scientific, mathematical, medical, and literary achievements. I am excited about this event because I know, despite all my efforts, my knowledge is still incomplete. I am also concerned with the negativity toward the religion and hope that together this event will help to shed some light on the truth about Islam. We will hear about the religion from Dr. Abdul Zahir, a scientist by profession and president of the Islamic Center of South Coast, Massachusetts. And also we'll hear from our very own Tamima Uden, 
a graduate of BCC and UMass Dartmouth, who now works at the college. Tamima will share her feelings and experiences about her religion. After their talk, we'll take questions from the audience. So now welcome Dr. Zahir. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Palik, and uh, let me thank all of you for coming here. Uh, I hope you are not forced into it. And uh, I would like to thank uh, the president, the committee, and everybody that Dan thanked, and uh, also Tahimima. She was uh, after me and finally got me. I just love, love to be speaking to students, and the reason is that uh, I, I think that that's the only community in the world which, with a very open mind. And it's what we make of it uh, will determine how they will do in five and ten years. Let me say that uh, when I looked, I, I, I spoke to the president, I said, well, what a s scene this is. I mean, look at how peaceful it is. So here is my objective. After this 20, 25 minutes, I want you to feel that we can really make the whole world like the, the, the scene you are seeing from here. We have to learn about each other before we make decisions. I was given this topic, I would uh, rather ask you, you ask me question and I explain, but you know, for the time that we have, and especially I don't want to have your teacher be thinking what the question they're gonna be asking, so I agreed to this format. The topic is, uh, is Islam uh, myth versus reality. Uh, in reality, I'll be saying um, more, not so much myth, but what is the false information that we have out there and uh, what is the truth about it? The biggest thing that came to my mind, and I'm sure uh, if you have any myth, uh, there will be a question and answer session, you can ask me any question. Uh, you know what the good part is? If I don't know the answer, I said I'm not an imam, I'll get you an answer. So I don't have to answer all the questions. So ask me anything that you want. The biggest myth that we see in all the news is the word jihad. And it used to really make me mad in the beginning, but now I laugh. I laugh at all those expert commentators on television and in radio. I do, I mean I said, God, I wish I could make that much money for not knowing anything. <laughs> so jihad in general, the myth is that jihad means for Muslim to fight every non-Muslim. Right? I mean, that's the myth we have. All the fighting going on in the world is because of this jihad. I mean, jihad, you know, it's, it, that's how it's pronounced on the TV. Everyone in the world who is up in opposition to the U.S. is a jihadi. You know, if you, if you, if you hear the word, the next word comes jihadi. And that makes it so romantically terroristic word. Romantically because it's an Arabic word. And suicide is a weapon of Islam. These Muslims, they use these suicides and they want to fight the whole world and the non-Muslim. Nothing can be more false than these statements. And I'm, I'm not here to, to give you a sermon about all the good things about Islam, and that's not the purpose of this meeting. What is actually the word jihad? Jihad means striving. That's the exact word. So if I were to tell you in Arabic, it will be more or less like this. All of you are doing jihad for coming here and listening to my boring lecture. And that, that's the truth. That's what jihad means. You could be sitting over there like the people and, you know, sipping coffee and enjoying your friends. Your parents are doing jihad for sending you to schools instead of sending you to a gas station making five dollars an hour in this very tough economic time. You're doing jihad on a Saturday night, not going out because you have an exam on Monday. So the next time you hear the word jihad, think of it means working hard and striving. Oh God, I'm everywhere, sir. Okay. Fighting in Islam. Fighting in Islam is only for protection as a defense. 
And let me tell you that if somebody says this is in the Quran and they don't follow it, regardless of whether their name is Muhammad or Ahmed, I don't consider them Muslim because this is the basic rule you have to follow what is in the Quran. So what is in the Quran, I took a verse and there are many more verses. Fight in the cause of Allah and the next time another word Allah, you wear Allah, it means God. Okay, it's the same thing like, like if, if somebody says uh, ma'un, mean water in Arabic. So if somebody say ma'un, you don't, we don't get excited, but when they say Allah, we get excited. It's just a translation. It means God. So fight in the cause of God, those who fight you, and do not transgress. The special thing is, if you ever get a chance, I want you to, to, to if you have a pen, to make a reference. And I tell it to all the Muslims and non-Muslim alike. If you were to read the last four verses of a chapter called Nahal, N-A-H-L in Quran, there will be nobody with the name Muhammad involved in any activity which will harm any human being. So let me give you this, these four. Here it is. And do not transgress limits, for Allah loves not transgressor. The only way a Muslim can fight is for defense. If somebody attacks you, you fight back. Mm -hmm. Fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan has less or nothing to do with religion. Making this statement a very big statement. I know, I mean, you know, uh, you, have, you are what, 100 people, 80 people with 80 different, uh, I'm sure, opinion. That's my opinion has nothing to do. I know especially the people of Afghanistan. Why do I know them? Because I know their culture. That's, I'm from the northern Pakistan, the most troubled area. And uh, so I know what the war is about. It's about the territory. If this is my land, this is your land. One person fighting the others and the infighting. And why will not there be infighting when you have a country with 60 to 80 person maybe more, unemployment. Think of it, uh, why so much phobia? Why so much uh, Muslim, Christian, Jews? And I'm not, I'm not mentioning Hinduism, Buddhist, and all the other, and the atheist, because you know they are not fighting each other too much. Who are fighting each other? The Abrahamic religion. The Muslim, the Jews, the Christian. So, so, has nothing to do with religion. Our people then use religion and I'll come to it. Suicide is strictly forbidden in Islam. And, and there is uh, one thing, there is not even a doubt. It's like absolutely strictly forbidden in Islam. This has been used as a weapon and I, was, I know about this because I used to, I love history. Uh, and uh, you know the, the suicide that I, it started, the major suicide started long time back. But the first uh, real proof of it, or the video of it, are in the Second World War, which was called Harakiri by Japanese. The Japanese people started the suicide. They will bring a plane and they will just put the plane, uh, just, just drop it and commit suicide. Sri Lankan Tamil Tiger, you know Sri Lanka. Sri Lankan Tamil tigers have been in the Southeast Asia. As they are the ones who have used uh, suicide as a weapon. They are not Muslim. So, so many other, uh, regardless of religion, have used uh, suicide as a weapon. So what, what, what we learn from this side, and I want you to, is what is jihad and how it is being uh, portrayed in the media is absolutely not true. You know, uh, let, okay, if I run out of time, you have to stop. I'd love to talk, sir. You have to stop me. The jihad, you know, in Quran, what is the best jihad? jihad bil mal They call it jihad bil mal the, the, When you are giving charity, charity is the best jihad, according to Quran. So think of these when you, when you hear these news. The myth, most Muslims are Arabs, and the myth is already proven wrong because I'm not an Arab. While Islam is often associated with Arab, there are only 10 to 15% of Arabs in the Muslim world. 
The biggest um, population is in Asia, which is about 69%. Uh, Africa, 27%. Europe, 3%. And then there are other parts of the world. I mean, these numbers go up and down, but roughly that's what it is. So when you see an Arab and Islam, Islam is not an Arab thing. There are more Muslims in Pakistan, India. And, and, and let me tell you, there are more Muslims in India than in Pakistan. And the largest population is in Indonesia, which is one of the most democratic country in the world. Islam oppresses women. My God, this is the question that I get all the time. Look at the people who wear hijab. And when you see the next time you see a Muslim girl wearing a hijab, believe me, don't feel pity for her. She's the most independent woman that you can think of. The oppression, most of the ill treatment that women receive in the Muslim world is based upon local culture and tradition. Has nothing, absolutely nothing to do with Islam. Practices such as forced marriage, spousal abuse, restricted movement is present everywhere. Has nothing to do with Islam. Present in many cultures of Muslims and non-Muslims alike. And I love India. India, I mean, I, I, I read the, there was a, you know, these, uh, whenever there is uh, some abuse in Pakistan, you will see it more in the news than if it is in India, Sri Lanka, South Africa. And I, I will come to it, what is the reason behind it? So the absolutely the woman's status in Islam is as equal to men as it gets. If you have question, I'll answer those two. In Quran, and how do I make this statement? Because in Quran it says oh, your wives are a garment to you and you to them. What is the garment is explained as protection. You are not the only protector of your wife. Your wife is your protector also. And this is statement like these are throughout the Quran. Muslims are violent and extremist. Oh, this is, this is a very, uh, this is one of the biggest myth. And not just the myth, but you know what I call it. Reality is terrorism cannot be justified in any interpretation of Islam. And why I say it? Because I just gave you a reference. Read the last four verses of a surah called Nahal, N-A-H-L, where even asking people to come to, to, if I were to give you a sermon about Islam, I have to do it what is called hikmah and beautiful preaching. Let me say a little Arabic. I always impress people with my Arabic. I don't know Arabic. I just know some Quranic Arabic. Call people to a good path with wisdom and a beautiful preaching. How can I do a beautiful preaching if I'm yelling? So there are very strict limits in Islam. In the violence and extremism, I want you to read the entire Quran. Let me tell you a, a, just a two-minute story. I'm sure everybody is looking at their watch. I went to a church here in Dartmouth. Uh, they invited me to speak to a church. They, uh, you know, I was, I thought there would be like five, ten people. We'll all sit together and we will, we will talk. As soon as I walk in, there is a whole group, like 50, 60 people sitting at a church, and uh, they told me all these questions and answer. They say Islam is uh, this eye for an eye. Man, you know, uh, Christianity. You know what is Christianity? And let me, let me just go away from this. I wish, I really wish, that all the Christians become true Christian. All the Muslims are true, true Muslims, and all the Jews become true Jews. And the world will be, and just look outside. That's how the world will be. And I mean it in every way. So I go there and they say the eye for an eye and I said, uh, you know what, I agree with you. But here it is, let's complete the verse. The last part of the verse is, if you forgive, that is better for you. This is the exact verse. 
one nice, beautiful young lady about 60 year age uh, walked up to me and said, Abdul, is there such a thing like peace in the Quran? I said, yeah, you know what? Probably our job is either harder or it's easier because the, the, the bar is so low. The entire Quran is full of peace, forgiveness, and, and uh, here is the problem. We, you, have you all seen, I mean, you're smart people, uh, U.S. Constitution, uh, this thick book. You know, it's very, very tiny book. Uh, that people, uh, you know, our uh, Senator Byrd used to carry it in his pocket. And then he will take it out and it's like a small book, very thin. You know, to interpret that Constitution, how many lawyers we have in the U.S.? Oh, you know, we'll all say, oh. And it's just to uh, interpret that Constitution. Quran is this thick book. People take references, half done references. The same thing Muslims are doing in the Muslim world. Taking references from priests and then using it for some purpose. Don't listen to it. Here is what, because it's incumbent upon us to make a judgment only after learning about it. If you see a, a verse of Quran, put on a big website, oh God, if you Google it nowadays, I get scared. There are so many sites with all different kind of information. You know, they, those are out of context. Why? Because if we say that Islam is this religion, or Christianity is this, or Judaism is this, then it, we, are, we, are, we are not looking at the smartness of human beings. If a religion existed for 1,500, 2,000 years, you know what is the best filter? The best filters are human beings. They will filter all the bad things. Because if a religion exists on violence and lies, it will vanish. I have no doubt in it. Because the religion has to be what the human nature wants, which is, look to your right side. The entire Quran, here is, uh, I, I have a small word. I really didn't have too much time. The, we have appointed you a middle nation. He, it's incumbent upon Muslim to always take the middle path. I can't go into the whole definition of this verse. A Muslim can never be an extremist, and he, otherwise he is not a Muslim. Simple as that. Like, look at this. We have appointed you a middle nation. I mean, the beautiful word of Arabic. And please, love Arabic. I love Arabic. This is the most rich language. And if you know Arabic, you will get good job in uh, everywhere. That I tell you something. Uh, okay, am I on the right one? I hope so. Yes. Is right. Islam is intolerant of other religions. It cannot be cannot be farther from falsehood than this statement is. Because throughout Quran, Muslims are reminded that they are not the only one who, that this is true. And you say, oh, I'm surprised, and you should be. Because most of the Muslims who don't read Quran are surprised when they look at it. Jews and Christians are called people of the book. People of the book. The Quran commands Muslims to protect monasteries, synagogues, churches, and everywhere, because that's where God is worshipped there in. I brought some verses. Don't want to make it a Sunday morning for you, uh, but let's see. Quran. Let's see what Quran uh, says about relationship with Jews and Christians. And, and, and when you read it, you know, it, it just, does it remind you of your Sunday morning or Saturday in the synagogue or church? You know, it's the same wording. And there are certainly among the people of the book, the Jews and Christians, those who believe in God in the revelation to you and the revelation to them, bowing in humility to God. They will not sell the sign. For them is a reward with their Lord. This is not all of them are alike of the people of the book and uh, are a portion that stand for the right. They rehearse the sign of God all night long and they prostrate themselves in adoration. They believe in God in the last day. They enjoin what is right and forbid what is wrong. And they hasten in all good works. 
they are in the rank of righteous. Quran is telling. So, so this whole thing that Quran, because Quran, what is Quran? Islam? Islam, you know, first Judaism came, right? We all know that. Moses came. Then Jesus came with Christianity. And then Muslim says that Muhammad came with Islam. Some of my friends says, oh, in Quran I see a lot of um, uh, things from Bible. And I said, you are so right, because uh, Islam is, we, is combining the three religions. And that's why when you see Islam, Islam has nothing, absolutely nothing to, to, to be against these, especially these two religions. So why all this phobia? I'm sure you have your own myths, and we can discuss that in the question and answer. So why all this phobia? Why is every Christian Muslim saying Christians are doing this to you and Christians saying Muslims are doing this? Why all this phobia? You know what is, what is I, what I call the biggest myth of all? Is the separation of church and state in politics. Why? Because our church and state are separate in constitution. So if you go to a court, they are separate. We have to have them separate. But in politics, they have all been mixed together. Why I'm talking about the USA, I can talk about Pakistan and other Muslim countries. I don't want to go there because I don't want to compare our standard of US to those standards. Our standards are much, much higher than that. And I mean it in all the good things, be, being a citizen of this country, be knowing what happens all over the world. I've been to Europe also, and even there I said, God, let me, let me run back to my country. And why I'm saying this is because when we combine politics and church, that's the exact phobia that you have. I want to give you an assignment. Okay, it's, you won't spend a minute on it, just for your thinking assignment. The phobia about Islam goes up. 10 notches every two years. Can I ask you why? It's, I know you know the answer, but why should you be thinking that way? Why? Because every two years we have Congress elections. This year is the election, again in November we have election for Congress, most of the Senate. And, and take it from me today, that after next two years, when there is presidential election, it will go even five notch higher. What will be the most peaceful year? The year after that. One year is relatively peaceful, and the next year, all these things come. Obama becomes Muslim, and all these things start. And I tell, people ask me, is Obama Muslim? And I said, you know what, there is a beautiful thing to Islam. It's I say that I'm not a Muslim. Okay, I'm not a Muslim, I'm out of it. So I said, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not gonna get into that. And the reasons are that these religious thing, and the same thing happens in all over the world, in Muslim country also. Election year, every bad thing is done by the US. There is a Christian and Muslim fighting going on. There everything becomes, but especially noted down every two years. So 2010, 2012 will be the worst. You will be hearing more and more about jihad and all these things. And I want you to please pay attention to it, that this is politics, because we don't have uh, no separation of church and state in politics. Okay, that was the tough part. Now is the easy part. What is Islam? So what makes somebody a Muslim? If I were to say right now that I bear witness there is no deity but God and Muhammad is the prophet of God, I became Muslim. That's it. If I say I'm not a Muslim, I'm out of Muslim. There's a, such a big freedom here. And who is a Muslim of faith? So let's see, uh, Muslim, and I'm not going to get too much into it because Tahmima has a beauty, you know, you will forget my presentation, it's nothing, she has a beautiful one. 
So there are five pillars of Islam. For somebody to be a Muslim, he has to have this oneness of God, the first one, which enters you. Then you have to do five prayers a day. It's not that hard, believe me. It takes five minutes. Concern for and giving charity to the needy. This is the third part. Uh, there is every Muslim and they are earning, uh, they have to have, and the cash value, two and a half percent is given to charity, which is a mandatory one. And then, you know, there is some more. Self-purification through fasting. We did fasting a month, uh, couple of weeks ago, it ended. Uh, and the pilgrimage to Mecca for those who are able. I mean, you have money and you have the health and you can do that. Okay, I'm going to just run through it. This is what I want you. But who is the Muslim of faith? The next time you see some name, body name Muhammad doing some activity, think of these values. A Muslim of faith is the one who believe in God, the one who believe in angels, the one who believe in scripture, Torah, Bible, Quran. You know what was in the last two, three weeks, the big uh, event which was advertised more than the election anywhere? Is the, that uh, burning of Quran event in uh, Florida. And did you hear anybody in the Muslim world, Alto, they are so excited to do anything, right? But you didn't hear it that if you burn Quran, we will burn Torah or Bible. You didn't hear it. Think about it. There is a big reason for it. Because the Muslim have to believe in Torah, Bible, and the Quran for them to be a Muslim. So Torah and Bibles are as important to us. Belief in prophet, which means you have to believe in Ibrahim. You have to believe in Moses and Jesus, in Isaac, and all, all the prophets. You have, we believe in life after death. And here is, here is another assignment for you. From this list, find out how many things we have in common and how many are the differences. I want you to do that. Belief in divine de decree, which means everything is predestined and the knowledge is with God. I, I mean, I'm going to run through it because they gave me not too much time. Okay, okay. Here is, I have, I, I brought these things for you because I want you to look at it. Here is what Quran says about Jesus and Mary. This is from the Quran. Uh, okay, you don't have to read the first one, but let's see the second one. You know, always these religious book translations are so hard. I wish somebody can make them easier. So, uh, look at this. Behold, the angel said, God has chosen you and purified you and, and chosen you above the women of all nations. This is God talking to Mary. Mary. Mary is the woman of, above the women of all nations. God gives you a good news of a, wor a word from him whose name shall be Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary. That's exactly the wording of Quran. Messiah. Uh, Isa ibn Maryam. That's how we call Mary Maryam. Isa is Jesus. Honored in this world and the hereafter. And one of those brought near to God. He shall speak to the people from his cradle and in maturity and shall be of righteous. Yes, this is what Quran says. I was telling one of my Christian friends. Uh, there is a, a priest actually who is a very good friend of mine. He comes to uh, the mosques all the time also. And I said, come on, uh, come on, Bob. I mean, if, if you were, if, if, you th if you just for five minutes realized how much the Muslims love Jesus, that should be enough for you to be hugging me each time you see me. And he laughed at me. What does Quran say about Moses? You know, the big Israeli, Palestinian, and this whole, the whole thing. Nothing to do with religion. I went to Israel. I met people there. I spent the whole week there. Very tough for a Pakistani-born American to go there, but I, I did. And I found people was, was not what we hear in the news. Was really not. Here is what Quran says about Moses. We gave unto Moses the scripture, and we appointed it as a guidance for the children of Israel, saying, choose no guardian bes besides me. This is what the, what the relationships are in truth. I'm going to end it 
And the ending doesn't mean that, because I would love to hear some questions and I will be later on. But I was told to talk about it. Yes, we believe in uh, life after death. And here is the, in a summary, that's how it's going to be. That on that day, all humans will become alive. And on that day, everybody will be accountable for their deeds. And the deeds are, if you did good deeds, you are good to go. And there is whole chapters on life after death in Quran and Islam. You are the best student these teachers can ever think of. So I thank you for the attention, and I hope you carry a message. And the message is that we don't really have to fight each other, and we don't have to fear each other. I want you, I really want you. Just don't worry about it. Even without covering your hair, just get into a mosque. Ask the question, and ask tough question. My daughter and some of the youth group in interfaith were uh, setting up some stall, and they said the, the Muslim stall, the Christian, and the Jew stall. So my daughter is a 15-year-old. And you know what? She plays basketball wearing a headscarf. I never told her to wear it. She does it. And she's in the junior team of Eponic at high school. So she went to so many towns, I had to go and say what the people say about it. And nobody cared. I I'm telling you, nobody cared. So what we have, my daughter was setting up, and I said, what is this? And she said, no, we want to answer all the questions people have. So I said, let me ask you the tough question. Why, why are Muslim terrorists? And she was like, mad at me. I said, no, no, you have to have an answer for it. I want you to go to a Muslim, ask a tough question. Are Muslim terrorists? Unless you ask it, you're going to keep it inside. Because he's going to start with every Muslim person will have an answer to this question for sure. That it has nothing to do with it. Because in the 9-11, even the FBI, I mean, I was reading it. I hope it's the truth. That, uh, the, that some of the terrorists uh, who went to Florida, before the 9-11, they went to a bar, a strip cl a club, and drank and think. And I said, you know, that should be enough for me to declare them non-Muslim. I want you to, to read be behind the line of politics, especially every two years. All politicians are not. It's, it's just, if I were to be running for a Senate and somebody told me, if you do this, you will uh, win it, I'm going to do the same. Nothing wrong with people. There are, but what, one thing I tell you, the best part is that 90, some people say 90, but I'll say no. 98% of the people uh, know what is right. It's just that they are the silent majority. They don't ask questions. We don't have time for it. I want you to please talk to each other. You see a Muslim girl with hijab, don't stay away from her. Go, ask her, why are you wearing this? I mean, and and you, you will learn about it. And the same thing is for the Muslim. I mean, you, you, most of you are not Muslim. That's why I'm gearing it towards it. But I do give lecture. When I go to Pakistan, I'm all the time fighting to def defending the US. It, it happens with us. And the same thing we have in interfaith. Go attend interfaith meetings. And interfaith doesn't mean all the people who don't even believe in God. Go out. Because these are your friends who need to be talked to and learned about. I thank you very much, and uh, we will talk later on, I hope. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Zahir. And we will have questions, but let me uh, take a moment to introduce Tamima Uden, who works in the nursing department of BCC and uh, is on the Multicultural Committee and has agreed to share her experiences as a young Muslim woman. Thank you, Tamima. Well, this is my first time <laughs> presenting um, uh, an event about Islam in front of all of you. Good morning and welcome and thank you all for joining us for a discussion on Islam. Today, I'm here to share my personal experiences living with and completing the five pillars of Islam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. 
This is a full version of the Islamic greeting, and the meaning is, peace be on you, so the mercy of Allah and his blessing. However, oftentimes we use the shorter version, which is assalamu alaikum. Before I go ahead and share my personal experience about the five pillars, I would like to give you a brief description of myself. I was born in Bangladesh, and my native language is Bangla, not Arabic. After my birth, my father migrated to the United States while my f mother and I stayed in my country. At age five years, I started attending the mosque and my elementary school. Mosque is also known as masjid, which is where Muslims go and do their prayers. While attending the mosque, I was taught how to read Quran and how to perform the prayers. Unfortunately, at that time, I was not taught the meaning of it because I spoke Bangla and the Quran is in Arabic, which is the Muslim's holy book. At my elementary school, I had five subjects, math, English, science, Islam, and history. All these subjects were taught in Bangla language as far as the Islam class, we were taught the history and the background of Islam. In 1997, I and my mother migrated to the United States. Upon our arrival, we stayed in Astoria, New York for about three years. At that time, my father worked at the World Trade Center. My mother was a housewife and I continued my education. In 2000, my family and I moved to the city of Fall River where my father continued to work at a restaurant. My mom was a housewife and um, I continued my studies at BMC Durfee High School. Upon completing high school, I began taking classes at Bristol Community College in 2003. Being a student, I also wor started working as a work study student in the student engagement office. Later, I was hired as a part-time employee in the Office of Disability Services and the Lash Center for Teaching and Learning. In 2006, I graduated from Bristol Community College with my executive administrative assistant and business transfer degrees. I then moved to UMass Dartmouth where I received my Bachelor's of Science in Accounting in 2008. And in October of 2008, I started working as a full-time employee in the Division of Health Sciences Office as an administrative assistant for the nursing program. Okay, so the, as Dr. Zaheer mentioned, there are five pillars of Islam. These are not in order, but the first one is Iman, which is known as Shahada, which means faith. As a Muslim, I believe Allah is the one and only God and Muhammad is the last messenger of Allah. The second is Salah, which means prayers. I pray five times a day. The verses um, of the five prayers contain verses from the Quran and they're said in Arabic. When I pray, I face Qibla, which is the direction of Kaaba in Mecca. The five prayers are performed at dawn, known as Fajr, midday known as Zuhur, late afternoon Asr, sunset Maghrib, nighttime Isha. The Islamic call to the prayer is called Azan. If you visit Muslim countries or the Islamic center, you will hear Azan when it is time for the prayer. In my case, I have a prayer time schedule that I follow in order to pray on time. I would like to share a YouTube clip uh, on Azan at this time. Oh, Marlene, I already.
The third pillar of Islam is charity. This is when we give some percentage of our earnings to the poor people. The fourth one is Swam, which is uh, fasting, which is also known as the month of Ramadan. The month of Ramadan is to help take the focus of the worldly things, so the mind and the heart are redirected to the spiritual things. In addition, this was the month when the Quran was established. At this time, Muslims cannot eat or drink from sunrise to sunset, and you are forbidden from any intimate relationships. One is required to start fasting upon entering puberty. Elderly women, women who are pregnant or nursing, need not to fast. This year, the month of Ramadan started from August 10th until September 9th. Usually, it is about 29 to 30 days, and I was fasting during those uh, days. I used to wake up at 1.30 a.m. and eat my dinner, and then I would break my fast at sunset. So the first Ramadan, the first fasting was around 8 p.m. That's when I would break my fast, and the last fast ended around 7.10 p.m. Yes, at first, the couple days, it is a little bit difficult because it's a different schedule we have to follow, but after then, I, I got used to it. The last one is Hajj, which is pilgrimage to Mecca. It is mandatory for a Muslim to perform Hajj at least once in a lifetime if he or she is financially and physically able to carry out this pilgrimage. I went to Saudi Arabia to perform Hajj in late December of 2006. I had the chance, this was one of the greatest experiences of my life because I met Muslims from all over the world. I stayed in Medina and Mecca for about 20 days. These are two important cities in Saudi Arabia. Upon my arrival in Saudi Arabia, I stayed about one and a half weeks there. This is a picture of Masjid Nabawi in Medina. This was taken from the hotel that I, was, I stayed, also known as the Prophet's Mosque, second largest mosque in the world, and Medina is the second holiest city for the Islam. This is a picture of my parents and myself. I'm in the middle. And this picture was taken in front of the green dome over the grave of Prophet Muhammad. Peace be upon him. That's what PBUH means. 
Prophet Muhammad was born in Mecca in 570 AD and he passed away in 632 AD. Prophet Muhammad is the last messenger of Allah, um, a messenger of Islam sent by Allah. This is the final resting place of Prophet Muhammad. Um, the green one that you see there, right underneath is where he was buried. So Muslims often go to Medina to pay respect and do their prayers in that mosque. After Medina, we went to Mecca, where we performed tawaf around Kaaba. What is Kaaba? Kaaba is where Muslims go and worship, also known as the Allah's house. To perform tawaf, there are a few steps that we had to do. The first one was we went around Kaaba seven times. Then we prayed near a station of Abraham, drank Zamzam water. We walked seven times between two small hills called Safa and Marwa and cut a few inches of um, our hair. The following days are the official days of the pilgrimage. The first day we stayed in Mina, which took place underneath the tent. That's where all the Muslims pilgrims gathered together. So I'm talking about millions of them. Mina is a small village east of the city. We prayed Zuhur, Asr, Maghrib, Isha, and Fajr, and read Quran. The second day, we went to the plain of Arafat. This is the site where Prophet Muhammad gave his famous farewell sermon before he passed away. We prayed Zuhur, Asr. Many of us asked for forgiveness and made supplications. Same day, we, stay, we moved to another location called Muzdalifa, which is surrounded by mountains, and we have to stay on the ground. This is just kind of to show that there are people out there who do not have a roof over the head. Uh, we prayed Maghrib and Isha there. We collected stones to throw at the three satans the following day. Day three of the pilgrimage, we left plain of Arafat, came back to Mina, and then moved toward a city called, uh, a site known as Jamrat for the stoning of the satans. Satans are considered the enemy and the devils of the Muslims. Satans discouraged Prophet Abraham from following Allah's command to sacrifice his son. The stoning represent rejection to the satans and the faithfulness to Allah's command. And the reason there are three satans is because Satan first went to Prophet Muhammad, then to his son Ishmael, then to his wife Hajara, and tried to discourage them not to follow Allah's command, which is why we throw stones at the three satans. Throughout the world, Muslims celebrate Eid al-Ajha on this day, which is known as the festival of sacrifice. This is a picture of Masjid Al-Haram in, uh, in Mecca. As you can see, the round, um, uh, the squared black house is Kaaba. And this surrounds, uh, Masjid Al-Haram surrounds Kaaba, also known as the Grand Mosque. This is the largest mosque in the world. Mecca is the first holiest city place for Islam. This can accommodate up to four million Muslim worshipers. This is another picture of, uh, the first picture is myself and my mom, and the second picture is my dad and my mom. Um, this picture was taken in the state of Ihram, which is symbol of cleanness and equality. At that time, you were forbidden to harm any living things, trim or cut, and, uh, cut hair or fingernails, and no intimate relationship. Normally women wear black burqa, black or white burqa, or native dresses with a scarf. It doesn't matter, you could wear another color burqa. And however, men are required to wear two white clothes, one of which covers the body from the waist down and one that is gathered around the shoulder. This last slide is a picture of Safa and Marwa, which is the first picture on the left. Um, this is also the, one of the steps that we performed when doing tawaf. These are the two small hills located in the Masjid al-Haram. Ibrahim's wife, Hajara, runs seven times between those two 
hills uh, in search of water for her son Ishmael. At that time, Allah rewards her with Zamzam water. From that day, Zamzam water continues to flow nonstop. The picture on the right side was taken on the third day of the pilgrimage. That's when some of the pilgrims were returning from Mecca after stoning the Satans. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, that was great. Um, now we can take questions, and I think, you got a mic over there, Professor Gilberg? So if people want to, um, you know, raise their hand, and Dan can bring the mic over, and you can ask questions, and like um, Dr. Zahir said, whatever questions you have, ask, because here's two people who could answer from their experience. I should say salam alaikum, I guess. I am from originally from Hyderabad, India. Oh, thank so you're you. my neighbor from long time ago. Wa alaikum salam. Uh, wa alaikum salam. And you too, Tamima. Uh, I guess I have worked a lot with Islamic families while in Hyderabad. So I have a question for you based on my experience of 10 years. Uh, I do agree and I have read parts of the Quran and also studied uh, the life of Muslims. But can you explain, I know the Islam itself, I think Muhammad certainly is one of the only people who has always put women equal to men in the book itself. And I'm wondering, why is it always interpreted and why is it the people who follow Islam, why is the practice so different than what is written is what I'm trying to understand. Very good question. You know, I, I like and questions. And also because I am a woman, I'm very interested in Oh, that. I love this question because, uh, and I, I like questions because this way you were listening to me. Uh, you know, well, here it is. I mean, if I were to say, let's look at the women, uh, uh, Muslim families in the U.S. And th these questions of that the women are oppressed is people who are not part of the culture. I'm from the north of Pakistan. When I go to South Pakistan, it's the same country. So I was born in the north. I went to Karachi University in the south. Even the South Pakistanis have a different opinions of the northern Pakistani. And they always tell us, you people of the north are very tough on women. And I said, I wish you could come to our house and tell this to our, the ladies of the house. This is our, if we were to have, let's say we have, uh, in America, we have the U.S. relationship. I would love for you to walk into any uh, Muslims in the uh, U.S. and see how the families are being treated. One thing I tell you, and this is, I hope it's, it, 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 uh, you know, it does answer a part of the question. If you are in uh, the U.S., and I tell this to everybody, if you see a truck driver in Pakistan, and I don't mean to say truck driver is any good, better than me, or worse than me. I'm making an example, which is a true example. A truck driver in Pakistan has the same characteristics like a truck driver in the U.S., which means I'm the king of the road, you know. You pass me, you're going to get it. Same thing. A truck driver in Pakistan has no relationship, and no similarity to a car driver in the U.S. Where I'm heading with this? I'm heading is this. Educated Muslims and educated Westerner, educated U.S. citizen, have more in common. A street, a, a guy who was homeless in Pakistan and a homeless in the U.S. have common traits in them. And I think we have to look at the world like that. When we are comparing an Afghani woman, an Afghani woman in the northern Afghanistan to uh, 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 an educated uh, US citizen, this is unfair. And I think we, that's why we have to look at it in that, that context. Islam and women. You know what the woman relationship is? I was sitting, I wish we had more time, and I'm going to come back sometime for another thing. I love you people, and I should be here. If I were to tell a woman, and, and, and I'm, I'm told that why the woman, when the, there is like, like, let's say the husband dies, or you know, the woman 
share is one half of the men share? Very fair question. And I, I think, I, I, I'm sure that's where we are heading. Why is it one half of the men share? And I tell the people, you know what is the woman responsibility in the house? Nil. A woman, according to Muslim, if you are following these rules, then any nice lady who is making money here, that money is for her only, where the husband money is for the whole house. If you can follow these rules, then you follow these rules of division. I would really request people, wherever you are looking at oppression of the woman, and I mean, uh, here the South African president, you, you know about that? I mean, probably not so much. He had his, what, fourth wife or sixth or seventh wedding while he's in the office. We didn't hear it too much in the news, right? And uh, rightly so. This is their tradition. Good or bad, this is their tradition, and he's a non-Muslim. What I'm saying is, look at the tradition and let us not mix up tradition with religion. This is so very important. Uh, we will set. We will. We can talk. And thank you for the question. Yes. It's a good thing you're here because I've always had this question since you're talking about women. I want to know if, uh, because they're always talking about marriage, how do you guys pick your wife? Because I usually hear that the parents pair you up when you were little, or I love <laughs> you guys have to pay for I it or something. You know, it, it, it happened in my case and it worked very good. I have a very beautiful one. I'll tell you again tradition. Here is what Islam is. You know, the tradition where I live in the north, I went from America. I was a, a graduate student doing my PhD in St. John. So I'm like the high fi American. I went to Pakistan, we were engaged, and I said, I have to meet, come on, let's, I knew my wife. I, I, I'll come to your question, but let me tell you exactly what it is. So I went there and I said, can I meet her? You know, don't bring what I was told by my elders. Don't bring this American thing to our house, okay? This is, you are here, here, and stay like that. Traditions, tradition. What is the Islamic rule? Islamic rule is the men and the women must meet and like each other. Does Islam allow dating like, no. Strictly no. I will say no. Will, should they be meeting and uh, selecting each other rather than the parent? Absolutely yes. So the, the answer is how we select is not a journal thing. It's where are you, where are, are you from Pakistan, are you from the U.S.? I have no doubt my son and my daughter will never follow my Pakistani tradition and they will have their own selection done. So there is no a journal rule for Muslim to, for selection. Uh, and, uh, you know, people do this uh, cultural-wise, yes. They are born even before born. If you have a son and you have a daughter, they're going to get married. And these are some tradition all over the world, regardless of religion. Okay, even if, uh, like you said, uh, parents say, you, if you have a son and I have a daughter, they should get married. What happens if the daughter don't want to get married with that person? Well, God I bless their daughter. tradition. I mean, I would love to find them. and. Uh, and really beat up. You know what, the only good thing is that now with the television and internet throughout the world, this thing is almost dying down from the cultures. Okay, so I'll keep it at that. Do the people start fighting each other? Yes, but it has nothing to do with religion. Let's keep that in mind. It's tradition, not religion. Yeah. Dr. Zahir, thank you for being here with us today. It's thank a great you. opportunity to ask this very important question that has to be on most of our minds. And it has to do with the thousands of factions, the millions of people who are so well organized in this world, who are in the name of Allah, in the name of Islamism, intent on destroying our country. So my question, the first part is why? And the second half is what can we do about it? Oh, I love this question. Let me, uh, I mean, if I can make any good news from it, it let, let me give you a rough figure. Even the FBI or CIA says they are not in million. 
they are not even in thousands. Some say they are in hundreds. And just to make a good news out of it, if there is any good news. Why they are the same thing? The same thing that what we are feeding from each other. Because these terrorists, they know that, you know, I'm not going to get chance to be talking to you. If they see me in this setting uh, talking to you people about Islam, they're going to find another way rather than saying it that in the name of religion, we want to destroy it. What can we do about it? I mean, I wish there was a thing, you know, although I do write all the time to congressmen and senators, I said, you know what, whatever you want to do, let's do it with the people who know the culture. Let's not sit in our office and make solutions. If you want to bring peace in Afghanistan, it's, I know them. I mean, it's not going to be brought by, let's say, if I kill 200, if you kill 200. I'll, I'll tell you just a quick example, I'm done. An example that they are Pashtuns. You know, I'm Pashtu. I speak Pashto is my language, actually. If you kill a Pashtun, he cannot go home, he cannot live, because this is his tradition, it has nothing to do with religion, that he has to take a revenge. So by killing one person, if he has, in the, all the third world or the developing world, they have a lot of kids tell you, I'm sure you know that. By killing one person, we have made many and multiple more uh, enemy. I will tell you this, that religions will be absolutely not the basis if we all decide here today that we are not gonna uh, fall prey to the, the propaganda of the religious extremism on all the sides. So to, to, to defeat them, to defeat them will be to accept each other and not to become, not for the Muslim to become Christian or the Christian to become Muslim. That's not for us, that's for God to do but for all of us to say that, you know what, I'm not going to blame somebody that you are a bad person unless I am sure about the action that he or she takes. We, we will be defending because if we are united in this United States, we, these people will be defeated. And they are already being defeated as the world is slowly turning to the U.S. side. Thank you. Yeah. Oh my God, I mean, condemnation is, I mean, it's not even my personal choice. The reason is I gave you Quranic station, uh, it's incumbent upon me, because here is one verse of Quran, and you, I'm sure you have read it and Google it. And this is the exact meaning of it. If you kill one person, it is like you, you killed humanity. Humanity. If you kill one person, you killed six and a half billion or something, how many we are. You killed he humanity. It's not even that. This is what Quran says. So for me, not when the people say, oh, why the Muslim don't condemn? They are not Muslim probably, because for, for, as a Muslim, it is incumbent upon me from the Quran to be condemning terrorism. If, if uh, I hope, yes. Yeah, Dr. Zahir, thank you for being here. Um, my question actually relates to what you mentioned earlier, the incident that you brought up in Florida where the priest was uh, uh, hoping to burn the Quran and he decided not to. Uh, the media helped us quickly realize that uh, it was only 50 people who were uh, supporting that. My question to you is what can moderate Muslims like myself uh, do to help everybody realized that when people like Nidal Hassan pick up the gun and shoot uh, people, that it's only one crazy Muslim who's doing that and that it's not, not uh, uh, the religion that's dictating that. Lovely, that's a great question. Exactly the 50 people there. And the same thing is with Nadal Hassan. I mean, Nadal, I would, I would love, and here is for all the teachers, and I, I will be one of the supporting uh, actor in that book. I want people to write books, the life of a suicide bomber, the life of Nadal, how many prayers he do. Did he even pray five times a day? Because these are not Muslims. 
I, I tell you what, if you are a Muslim, you have to believe. In Quran, there is another verse. Enter Islam in totality, which means you cannot say, I'm going to accept this part of the Quran and I'm not accepting. In Quran, it says if you kill one person, you kill the whole humanity. So for me to call even Nadal and make him this high five Muslim, it's, it's just false. It's the myth. It's the myth, because I want to make him the, the thing. Otherwise, I would, what I would be working on? I'll be saying, how many times he went to Syria? Who was his connection? Was this guy, to tell you the truth, the guy, when I read his history, he was a cuckoo from the beginning. I mean, to tell you the truth, I know his history. So to, to make him this high five calculated Muslim, is totally wrong, because he's not. And what the moderate Muslims can do, talk to people. Don't get offended by question. Like, I'm not, right? I mean, I'm being, being bombarded, but I'm not because I love it. Unless we ask question and answer it, we are not going to be, we, we're going to be this goody, 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 but not the real you. truth. I'm sorry. I have to stop. Okay. Well, we're out of time. I know people have to go to class, but let's give a big hand and also to Dr. Zahir and to Mima Udin. There are refreshments here. Please help yourself on your way out, and please remember to Thank do the evaluations. And if you didn't have a chance to ask your question, these two, you can come up to uh, Dr. Zahir and Tamima and ask them, okay? So feel free. Thank you very much.